And this is when it tells me we've gone live, but it's not obvious. Excellent. So then I just assume that there's hopefully people can see us. Just waiting for it to tell me that we've gone live. Yes, okay, there's past us. So just waiting for people to turn up. Lovely. Hello, people who are turning up. Eight of you also already. We'll do proper introductions in a bit. And David is just cross posting as well. Who's here already? Say hello if you like. We have got an interesting one for people today. David and I had a great conversation to um, put this particular live together. I don't know if my comments are working. Oh, they are. Okay, lovely. Hello, Laura. Hello, Austin from Texas. Twenty people. Okay, there's twenty people. That's enough to to do some introductions at least, and then anyone else who turns up, um, hopefully they know who we are anyway. Um, so, hello, I am Dr. Chloe Farahar of All Academy, and I am joined today by David Gray Hammond, also excitingly of All Academy, because David has agreed to um, come and support us and do some more uh, co-presenting and lives, which is very exciting. So, hello, David. Hello. <laughs> um, for anyone who's potentially new, um, like I say, we are Academy, which is an educative platform where we talk and discuss and educate about anything relating to being autistic um, as taught by only autistic people. Um, but anyone's welcome to come and learn and chat to us, which would be lovely. Okay, 30 of you, good. Okay, that's a, that's a good number. Um, oh, lots of people to say hello to. Hello everybody in the comment section. There's a Luby Lou, lovely, hello. from Hampshire. Susie from Lincolnshire, fantastic. Um, so, usually when we have guest speakers, we do introductions. I think we can do that once more time with you, David, and then you're so established as Academy. Um, that we don't necessarily have to do it again. So David, would you like to give a little brief overview of who you are? Uh, yeah, um, I'm David Gray Hammond. Um, I run the Facebook page Emergent Divergence. Um, I'm an autistic mental health and addiction advocate primarily, um, but I have a general interest in the well-being and mental health of autistic people. Um, I do tend to focus on addiction and psychosis though. Um, I'm also Chief Operating Officer at Neuroclastic, and as you now said, I'm now on board as a co-presenter with Our Academy. Yay. Exciting, um, which is lovely. Um, and today, um, so David approached me because of this particular topic um, interests him, um, and maybe we can talk about why you kind of were like excited about talking about this. But today we are talking about the importance of popular media um, of any description for autistic well-being. Um, so how come, because you were like, you've always got ideas and you was like, I've got this idea and I've got this idea. Um, but this one, for some reason, seemed to come out as quite um, one that you're quite excited about. Well, for me, things like film, literature, music, um, television, so much of my well-being uh, relies on these things. Um, they've got me through some really dark times with addiction and psychosis. Having that ability to escape into a story or into a piece of music is just, it's a beautiful thing, really. I, I just, I adore all the different forms of media 
and uh, I'm just really excited to talk about how that looks for me and how that supports my well-being and why I think it's important for other autistic people as well. I think and I think that's interesting and, and I'm so glad that yeah you're going to support us on Academy because um, obviously there's so many different ways that people can come at this idea of educating or discussing autistic experience um, and I think although you and I do it in very different complementary ways is we seem to focus quite a lot on well-being in in particular um, yeah. as opposed to you know we do talk about what is autism and things like this but well-being seems to come out um quite a lot um so how come you decided to do this topic now or is it one you've been wanting to do for a while it's one I've been thinking about for a while, but I had other topics to cover with you that I felt I needed to do first. Um, and then I was really thinking about it. I was like, no, this, this one can't wait any longer because honestly, I'm just excited to have a chance to nerd out a bit about some of my favourite pieces of literature and film and television and music. So That's a very yeah, good I point, couldn't actually. contain myself any longer. That's a point. So, because obviously, I say obviously, um, different speakers that we have on, um, we set up and prepare in different ways. You and I typically set up by having a whole conversation, making notes, and then basically having the conversation almost again. Um, yeah. But I'm just thinking we didn't mention that or pick up on that, but that's actually, a, I don't think so anyway, a key point, which is that the nerding out part and really connecting with other people based on your nerdy interests of like in the media and things like that so I think that's quite an interesting one because that's about connecting and well-being with other people yeah and it's such a it is such a valid point I know that you know I've, I've got these two my two best friends Jay and JT and uh, I'd, I'd say about 40 percent of our conversations are just Lord of the Rings quotes <laughs> you know we we really connect on these things you know it's 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 a really important part of our friendship you know we we make time together to sit down and watch the whole lord of the rings trilogy from beginning to end you know we talk about all the different lore behind the the, the stories and especially tolkien's world you know uh we you know it, it's you know and the other one is star wars of course uh we we do love a bit of star wars um and it's just, yeah, once we get talking about this stuff, you know, we it's like we can just go on forever. I've lost count of the number of conversations we've had that have gone on to like five in the morning. We've gone, oh, look at the time. We should have slept. You know, but we've been so busy getting lost in the story and discussing everything we love about it. And, you know, it's it's just fantastic, really. I'm going to put that as a note so we can come back to that one, I think, because I think that that's quite although we might end up talking about it now that's quite an important point which is that, that yes we connect with other autistic people and enjoy ourselves via those media so like films um or series or you know books um you know Sai said in the comment section that he could talk about star trek and star wars all day long um and so obviously if you find other autistic people who share that with you it's it's that sharing of your personal specializations and the things you're really interested in so i yeah. think yeah i can see the real well-being benefits of that because it's also back to that idea of communicating on um in the same way that we get yeah. to do that because we're nerd like you say nerding out in that positive uh life affirming way of like yeah i like and I, I think i think especially because as neurodivergent people, one of the, the big ways we communicate is info dumping. And it's it's such a beautiful thing when it's two autistic people doing it because they can sort of take it in turns and share in the joy. It's, it's not, you don't have people going, oh, well, you just shut up. You know, it's people going, no, no, I, I, I know what you're saying. I, I love it. Did you know this? Yeah, but did you know this? You know, and it could just go on for hours. And it's, it's just, I just love it. And I think that is really important because like you say, I think a lot of us um, have been told by typically non-autistic people, but there will be autistic people who don't share the same interest as you. So they might not be interested in you 
I don't mean you personally, but, you know, people going on about their thing that they're interested, like it's Star Wars or whatever. Um, but I think we're so used to that, that people not being interested in listening to what we're so passionate about so then when you do find those other autistic nerds who have the same interest um like say films and things like that it's actually really fun and just so connecting and yeah life affirming okay um i'm gonna look at the questions that we've actually got um so the first one we talked about i think when we had our sort of pre-chat was autistic representation in the media i don't think this this is just an order of how we sort of ramblingly went about the conversation but the yes the first note i've got is autistic representation in the media and autistic coded characters um any thoughts on that well this one's a bit of a it's a sticking point i think for the autistic community because i want to say historically but as we all know up to date there have been some pretty poor representations of autistic and autistic coded characters in the media um you know i i think we all know about the controversy over sears film um you know we all know what people think of that so i don't think we really need to get into that one too much another big one that i think people struggled with uh, i don't hear about it so often these days but when i was first getting into the community i had a lot of people voicing frustrations over sheldon cooper from the big bang theory um now that was an interesting one for me because i kind of related to him in a lot of ways um, I, and I like Sheldon Cooper. I think he's actually, he and Amy are possibly the only um, nice, kind, innocent characters on that show. And so yeah. I think my issue, because I do, I do actually like that show for, you know, the sort of guilty pleasures. It's, you know, it's a bit of silliness and, and some of the humour is, you know, funny. Um, I think the large issue with that that I had I liked Sheldon Cooper. I would be his friend. You know, I could really see that I could connect with him. And I'm really quite similar to him in a lot of ways. I have a spot on the sofa. You know, I've got those sorts of things that he, um, ha you know, experiences on the show. I think my biggest issue was how awful everyone was to him. He was the butt of jokes. And that was, was exactly what I was going to say. He is always the butt of the joke. Yeah. And I think that. But to me, in a way, that's kind of an accurate portrayal of autism because autistic people are so often the butt of the joke. You know, we're we're seen as the free entertainment. Oh, let's invite the quirky guy to the party, you know, because he'll be fun to have around. And it's not because they like you as a person necessarily. It's because they find you amusing. And, you know, I think that's that's part that's a quintessential part of the autistic experience, really, is being the butt of the joke. It's something we've all experienced. But it would have it, it would have been nice to see Sheldon Cooper treated as a character who had, you know, was treated with equal respect, um, you know, as. As, you know, any anyone else on the show, um, I also took some I had some issues especially as I came to understand my own asexuality, because I, I think especially when it comes to Sheldon's sexuality on the show, he's very much infantilized. You know, he's he's treated with the whole, you know, the, the, he kind of gives off the whole sexy zicky vibe, which I think can be quite harmful to autistic people, especially autistic aces. Um, you know, I don't think there has ever been a perfect representation in the media, but I can understand why people took umbrage with Sheldon Cooper. Um, you know, there were things about him that weren't great. He, you know, he he could be a bit arrogant, you know, and, you know. But he... sometimes I wonder, was he arrogant? I sometimes saw him just as being blunt and relative, like there was no malice. I never saw malice there, whereas the, the way that people spoke to him, there was genuine cruelty, I thought. And yeah. so actually, like I said, I actually liked him as a person. I think yeah, I would have I, been his friend. Like I said, I really related to him. Um, and in fact, my mother and sister for years called me Sheldon. 
I've because called, I was so much yeah. like him. I've been um, called the female. Um, uh, well, they were trying to insult me, but at the same time, it was like it was a ridiculous insult. Um, but I, I had my short hair, and it was um, that I was like a female lesbian version because of the hair, which was ridiculous, um, of Sheldon Cooper. Um, it's, yeah, just those sorts of stereotypes. And to some extent, I'm like, well, I quite like him anyway, so it's fine. I mean, obviously the issue is that he's, again, another uh, white sort of savant male, I guess. Yeah, and I think that's probably where the problems really lie with that portrayal, because it is a very kind of stereotypical portrayal. Um, he is relatable to, well, you know, I guess stereotypes exist for a reason. Mm you know and he is relatable to a lot of people but that that's still only a portion of the autistic community you know there, there's there's no reference there given to you know BIPOC and BAME you know people um there's there, there's no mention of you know transgender people who are autistic you know it's very much this is a a white male who is asexual and you know a savant which i think is i i think for a long time that's all people thought of when they thought of autistic people and i think the issue with that as well is that because obviously we've got this idea of autistic representation where they are specifically and explicitly meant to be autistic and then you've got autistic more autistic coded and it's never stated so sheldon was never stated as being autistic he was no. coded um, in in that way that we could potentially recognise. I mean, his bazinga, to, to make it clear to people that he's joking, I've always done that, where I tell a joke and I just know that people don't typically understand my jokes. So at the end I go, oh, I'm so funny, to kind of make it clear it was a joke. So there were so many things about him that the, the coding of his autistic nature was, was quite... Um, yeah representative I think size point is quite a good one that I don't think a perfect perfect representative can be achieved in one person absolutely because no one autistic is the same um I think I guess our difficulty is that because there's so little representation and so little good representation that maybe we do expect too much from autistic coded characters yeah, yeah. I, I think it's I think size point's important, you know. I, I'm not entirely sure how you would represent the entire community in one person. I think to do that you would have to create a character that isn't realistic at all. Yeah. Because the whole thing that makes autistic culture beautiful is that we're all diverse and different, you know. And I, I think if you try to compress that into one person it would probably be quite horrifying actually and i think when we talked about this i think we were talking about how typically when people are trying and making explicit that they're writing an autism character that's usually where it goes wrong so if we think yeah. about some of the i think we we'll focus less actually on even naming the ones that we think are problematic and we'll focus on the good stuff but you know some of the the clearly explicitly autism written characters um in any media are usually the problematic ones um, and usually because they're being written by non-autistic neurotypical people um so i think what we ended up talking about was autistic coded characters where it's not explicit or it was almost accidental where we feel that they were better representations of autistic experience um so yeah. I love, and I know lots of people who love Abed in Community. Abed is one of my favourite characters. I I I love Abed, and I like actually he's. There are characters in the show who aren't respectful towards him at all, but then there are he still gets some respect from others, and you sort of you see that even mixed. You know, you can tell people, you know his relationship with Troy, Troy just accepts him for who he is. You know, it's it's just Troy, you know, it's just a genuine friendship there. And there is maybe a question as to whether Troy is neurodivergent in his own way, because Troy is quite a quirky yep. character as well. 
Um, and uh, but Abed is another character that I really strongly relate to, um, especially with his his love of television and and film. You know, and the way everything is a reference to that. You know, I, you know, so so much in my life I'm referencing TV and film. You know, it's it, and it, it's it, I. You know, much like Abed, you know that kind of media is how I make sense of the world I live in. It's how I've learned to be the person I am today because I learned at a young age that I didn't relate to the people around me, but I could find people that I related to on a screen or in a book. And I think because they tend to be much clearer on it and things do get a bit, they are made more explicit, like the storylines and things like that. So it makes it easier to understand, I think, those characters. Um, yeah, I think we'll move on to the next bit, but I just wanted a couple, if we can think of other people are, are making comments as well, but other potentially autistic coded characters that we like. And potentially, I think the majority I can think of weren't written as autistic people. One I've got to mention before I forget, because I don't know if anyone's going to get this, Roy Cropper in Coronation Street. He is so quintessentially autistic coded, and I, I love his character. He's one of my favourite characters in Coronation Street. You know, I remember watching it with my mother and my grandmother growing up, and, and even still watching it today with my mother. And I just watch Roy, and I'm like, that dude gets it. That dude's autistic, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I was thinking, like, the one that I tend to think of is, um, oh no, in Guardians of the Galaxy. Drax. Thank you. Yes, Drax. Um, you know, he's an alien, he's strong and all this kind of thing, um, but he is, he's very literal. I mean, I love the, you know, the comments of, um, uh, oh, it's gone over your head. And he's like, no, but I would catch it and stuff like that. And it's just um, a lovely way of, yeah, I think that's an autistic coded character. And I think that's why having these portrayals, especially the autistic coded ones that seem to do so well by accident, I think that's why they're so important because it's a real moment to rejoice in when you're autistic and you see a character on the screen, and you finally go, yes, it's someone I can relate to, you know, and it, it's it's just a really joyful moment, you know, and, you know, it's it's been really helpful with some of my neurotypical friends when they're like, David, why do you do this? I'm like, watch this film, watch this character, you know, you'll, you'll get it, you know, and they come back and they kind of understand my world a little better. And I think a lot of, of different minority groups that aren't represented often or well in any forms of media whenever you hear different groups like the different minority groups talking about not being represented I think it's fair to say including autistic people we don't want it to be necessarily about autism we just want to see ourselves as part of all the storyline like it, it does you know just, do you know what I mean like why does it have to focus on this idea of explaining autism to the audience almost yeah I mean I don't really care if they say whether they're autistic or not I just love seeing a character that I can go this is me yeah this this they 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 someone understands a part of me you know it's that moment of realizing that there are people out there who can kind of imagine the world from your point of view and that's that's a really special thing to have. And I, and just going back to Abid again, because yeah, when, when I watched him, I do the same thing as I do with most people that I think, oh my God, you're autistic and you're amazing. And I'm just like, I would be their friend. I would so be, his. I would be in the, the um, uh, blanket fort and you know, all that kind of stuff with Abed. And I think what's lovely is that it did later transpire, didn't it? That it was the writer who wrote the show based Abid on himself before realising he himself was autistic. Yeah, yeah. I really liked finding that out. That was one of my favourite little fun facts about the show. Yeah. yeah. And I think ultimately when you do watch the whole show um, is that really the show is actually about Abid. It is his show. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They kind of start out with Jeff seeming to be the main character, but actually when you look at it, 
Ahmed is the one that drives the storylines. He's he's the one that he tends to keep the group together, yeah. you know, and he knows what's going on all the time, you know. And I just I, I especially love those moments in the show though, where you know, uh, I, it's one of my favorite moments, and it happens a few times. You know, everyone will be sitting around putting weird faces. They'll be going, you know, what's going on? Are you hungry? You know, or or are you sad? Are you hungry or are you sad? I can't read your faces. Or um, another favorite time of mine, uh, you know, which I think really puts the spotlight on uh, Abed and what an important character he is to the comedy of the show, but in a respectful way, is um, it's in the first episode and they're all mouthing things at each other, you know, because Jeff's upset and they're sort of mouthing things at each other, you know, oh, come on, let's let him in the group. And uh, Abed's like, what's going on? Have I gone deaf? You know, he just, you know, and it's just, it, it's something I would do, you know. I I, I have moments like that, and it, it, it's just one of. The, there's so many reasons I love Abed from Community. And I think then we're just going to make this about. It's just going to be like an Abed um, love mm. <laughs> session, um, which is that. Yeah, you. I think as autistic people, we can be there and connect with it. We can laugh with him, and we're not laughing at him. And I think that yeah. that's actually quite rare for us to have a character that we can actually do that and feel that maybe other people are hopefully laughing with him um, rather than at him. Um, yeah. Okay. So that was literally like the first question. So different media. So we sort of started talking about the different media for well-being. So the import. So the whole point of this particular session was to talk about the importance of books, television, films, video games for autistic people. So some of the um, pointers that I've got here from when we discussed before um, was things like escapism. Um, so for you, what kinds of, what are the important things? So we've talked obviously about seeing representation, connecting with other autistic people. So what other things, and like I said, I've got the note of like escapism. Well, yeah, I think the big one here is escapism, you know, um, when the world is getting too much, I can escape into a book, I can escape into a film, I can escape into television, I can escape into music. I mean, music especially, you know, when I'm doing things around the house, especially things that perhaps dysregulate me a little, you know, that I struggle with, I will just put an album on from beginning to end. And I will just focus on that. And before I know it, I've done the jobs that are making me uncomfortable. I just get lost in it. And it's like, it's it's fantastic. And, you know, I, I don't get so much chance to read these days, but especially as a child, I would sit and I would read for hours. I mean, hours. And I mean, obviously, I know the issues with the Harry Potter series, but before those issues were known, um, when I was a teenager, I remember reading the last Harry Potter book. I read it from beginning to end twice in one sitting, you know, and I I just got lost in it, you know. Um, the other one, the, the other piece of literature I think I've mentioned already in this live stream, Lord of the Rings. I mean, if you something you can get lost in, get lost in Tolkien's Middle Earth because it is the most vividly detailed and thought out fantasy world that I think anyone's ever created I I don't think if you want an escape and you want to escape into just a world of all the magic you can imagine Tolkien's books are the ones for you and they are quite heavy going reading um, you know they they're not an easy read but they're just, there's something so beautiful about them. I mean, if I was going to say any piece of writing was a masterpiece, I would say it's Tolkien's books. I know, it's... Well, I, I was quite late to start reading or getting interested in, in reading as a child. Um, I do remember that, I think I must have been about nine or ten, my granddad read avidly all the time and I remember feeling sneaky and picking a book up and having a read and it was something like the hunt for red October or something really random um and just sort of like got into reading because my granddad had all these books um and I did I got the Hobbit 
as a teenager and I loved The Hobbit and I got so because it's quick and it was um, relatively short and it was quite um, obviously fast paced and things. I did try The Lord of the Rings at that age, but it was really quite hard. Um, I think I got frustrated because I was only I was already halfway through the first book and they're epic books like size wise um, and they were still in the Shire talking about how green the grass was or something and I got really frustrated so I did it I did the see the um uh the, the series of books as an adult when I was going to be more likely to um appreciate them I think I think what got me into reading was I, I remember when I was a really little child my mother would read me the tales of red wall by Brian <gasps> Jacks oh my god yes I love we didn't talk about this in the um the I'm very excited yeah, I Martin the books. Warrior. I will, I will, I will remember Martin the Warrior to the day I die. You know those those books. They introduced me to they introduced me to the world of literature, and that's why I was so sad when Brian Jacks passed away because he was such a big part of my childhood. You know, every, that he every was, time I go into a secondhand bookshop, I go and see if I can find like the series so that I can read them as an adult um so for people who don't know well, you know I think I still have most of the series actually from when I was a child I've got them on just... a bookcase at my mother's house can, can you describe the series um or, or sort of the um because obviously there's a, there's a number of books but just the idea of the series so it's kind of like a, a medieval sort of I guess would you say medieval I, I guess I, I mean I, it's I fantasy it's kind of, isn't it so it's yeah it's 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 like medieval fantasy I guess but instead of people all of the characters are woodland creatures so Martin the warrior is I, he's a mouse I believe isn't he it's, it's been a long time since it, it, they since are a mouse yeah 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 you know Martin the warrior is this brave warrior but he's a mouse and you know they they have wars and and they have this abbey called Redwall Abbey um and and they sort of they they all coexist there and they they have you know they have these wars going on with with other creatures but that's what i loved about them as well they were epic battles and you know you, i got remember getting very attached to the different creatures you know the different animal characters and being really genuinely um sad when you know one of those characters would die in battle and things like that and they were just so beautifully written um, yeah. Even now, because I'm a very visual thinker, I'm seeing the imagery that I would imagine when I read those books as a teenager. And I'm seeing it's a particular one, which is where they fought on like um, kind of like a mountain. But the, yeah, anyway, but yes, yeah, so I've I've got that. I've just got such an attachment to that series. Did you know that Netflix have just bought the rights to make a television program out of the Tales of Red Wall? I don't know if I'd watch it. Yeah, I don't know if I'd watch it because I've got these images in my head of what I imagine from the books and I don't want anything to ruin that. They'll probably like make it they... too cheesy. It'll be too, like, Disney-fied or something, whereas in my head it was quite gritty and kind of, even as a teenager, it was, like, gritty. Like you say, that, that sort of dark medieval kind of imagery. Um, and I bet they'd ruin yeah. it. If they if they're going to do it, they are going to have to nail it because there is an entire generation of children who will probably have a riot if they mess this up. And so I think this, yes, yeah, so some somebody's made some comments as well about for them, for instance, it's escape away from sensory bombardment, um, and they can escape into transcendental meditation. Um, because the note that I said, like I say, we've got escapism. So for us, um, any forms of media that we can get absorbed in um, gives us that break from the real world that's quite tough on us as autistic people. Um, and particularly that person saying about sensory bombardment, you know, for a lot of us, it's really, really difficult. Hello, Pusta. Um, it's really, really difficult <laughs> for us to tune things out. Um, but for some reason, there's certain media, whatever your interests are. So if you're a gamer, if you're, you know, you like to read or you like films, it's it's 
one of the few things I think that really pulls us away from the things that are actually quite distressing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I couldn't have survived addiction and psychosis without literature and well, not so much literature at the time because trying to get into a book when you're really, really, really high or really, really, really psychotic um, is is very difficult. But especially, you know, uh, one we haven't mentioned was video games. That's another form of media and storytelling. And for me, that has... I remember when, when I was at the height of my addiction, everything in my life was falling apart. And I would just get lost in the world of this video game called Destiny. And I still play it today, nowhere near as much because I have a lot more going on in my life now. But it it was just such a wonderful escape. And, uh, you know, it's... All of these things are just... If we didn't... You know, not, not to sound alarmist, but when you consider that the suicide rate for autistic people is already nine times higher than the average population i believe that's the statistic um it scares me to think how much higher it could be without these things without these escapisms it actually made me think of there's there's um it's a it's a good little sort of meme cartoony thing um where there's an autistic child beautiful color world in a book and then um a, a parent figure comes in and they say, come on, it's lovely outside. You know, you, you want to be outside and go and have fun. And then the picture is them and it's all grey, like the child and it's all grey. And it's kind of like they were already having fun. And <clears throat> given what you've just said about the importance, of <clears throat> sorry, the importance of it for our well-being, I think that's something key for non-autistic people to understand as well, which is that if you've got an autistic child or an autistic adult, and it just looks like they're just constantly too, in quotation marks, absorbed in a video game or television show or whatever it is, realising how much importance there is in that being able to be absorbed in something. When it's yeah, really and hard I would for also, our brains to be quiet. I would also say to any parent worried about how lost their autistic child is in books or well, not so much books I don't think people tend to worry too much about books but you know if they're worried about their child you know wanting to watch tv too much or films or play video games if you want them to come out of that and engage with the real world more I would say you need to look at what's going on in the real world for them because you know like we've been saying it's it's a really important escape and if a child does not want to come away from that escape it says to me there is something in the real world that they're struggling with you know we we get lost in our escapes because we need to escape you know it, it's it's not just a case of being stubborn you know we we don't get lost in these worlds just to prove a point you know it's it's you know it, it's it's genuinely for our well-being and I think then, because that, like I said about the, um, th that's quite important for us because for a lot of us, the amount of autistic people I've talked to who say the same thing as me, that it's it's near on impossible to have a quiet mind. So our, our minds are always going. They're always problem solving, overwhelmed, or, you know, just constantly thinking. Um, and so for me, um, when we talked about this before, um, before the before the live um, you know before I go to bed my mind will not shut up it just is telling me the things I need to do the things that I'm worried about um, all sorts of things so I have to um, read fiction of some description before I go to bed to get absorbed in something else and get my mind to be quiet or um, daydream about having an autistic planet um, <laughs> So, you know, to, to escape from that really chaotic and noisy mind. See, for me, I have to watch television, but it has to be something I've watched before. And I think we're going to touch on this, aren't we? The repetition. You know, I 
I will watch the same television program over and over and over. And, you know, it's so important that I'm able to do that because it gives me safety and security. You know, there's no anxiety over, oh, what's going to happen next? Because I know what's going to happen next. And I already know that I love the show, you know, and, and repetition doesn't bore me. You know, I, I, I've, you know, I've got friends, even autistic friends who are like, David, you've, you've watched this show like 40 times now, you know, maybe it's time to find a new one. But I'm like, no, because, you know, these are my friends on the screen. You know, I want to visit my friends, you know, and it's such a place of safety for me. And I will do that before I go to bed to to sort of wind my brain down. When I put those shows on, it's typically either Brooklyn Nine-Nine or New Girl. When I, when I watch those shows, it tells my brain that it's time to start calming down for the night. And I I've, can't sleep without watching those shows. Louis never seen um, New Girl. And we've run out of um, uh, a series that we were watching. And so we started New Girl yesterday and he seems to be liking it. So I think this is going to be our show for a while. And what I was thinking when I was watching that is, again, particularly the first couple of episodes, they are really trying to make like the, the, the three guys that she lives with. They're really trying to make Jess neurotypical. They're like, tone it down. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, don't do that. I love her character. Her, she would be my friend. The 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 singing yeah. random songs about her life. I do that. You know, the weird little dances and the sort of genuine quirkiness because I think Zoe Deschanel is basically herself on that on that show. Um and so yeah, I like her. she's definitely neurodivergent coded character. You see, I I also really relate to Nick because he's, uh, I think he's sort of coded neurodivergent as well. But also another bit that I relate to, he's got this sort of, they sort of allude to it, but he has a bit of a drinking problem. You know, he's a little bit too reliant on the alcohol. Now, obviously that's not as bad as I was, but it's still relatable. And he's this aspiring writer and anyone who's followed my work knows that I love to write, um, you know, and, uh, I find him a really relatable character. So, uh, you know, not, you know, he, the, the way those two characters progress throughout the show, not wanting to give away any spoilers, I had to think about that for a second. The way they progress throughout the show is is a really pleasing dynamic to me. Yep. So I think this might be our, our new show uh, in, in the Dr. Chloe household. Um, I want to come back to that then. So the autistic thing of re-watching. So like I say, we talked about this before, which is um, so particularly as well, if you've got uh, an, if you've got an autistic child and we're not necessarily talking about yourself as an autistic adult, for instance. So if um, you're talking about an autistic child, I do hear it where people say that they're worried or, oh, they're watching, I don't know frozen for the millionth time today and, <clears throat> and all this kind of thing and it's like, like there's a few things that we talked about for, before which is something I find quite beautiful about autistic people generally speaking obviously it's going to be varied across people is that we find it just as enjoyable if not more so the millionth time round which I don't think neurotypical people Neurotypical people will sort of seem to anyway lose that interest. Like it's not as fun or it's not as funny, whatever the activity is, um, several weeks, months, years later. But we don't have that. We still find enjoyment or we find things that out new that we, even though we've watched something for the millionth time, um, which I think is quite a beautiful thing. I mean, the thing I love about the repetition is that, yes, it's, it's repeating itself. I know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, it's safe, it's secure. But also, as you said, you are watching, you discover something new every time. I mean, I've lost count of how many times I've watched New Girl and Brooklyn Nine-Nine, but every time I watch it through, I always notice just a little detail that I didn't notice before. And that will please me for hours, the fact that I noticed that little detail. And it'll almost flesh the world out even more, you know, and it's, I just find that really important. And, you know, I do the same with films, you know, a film, uh, 
going back to Lord of the Rings, I have watched the Lord of the Rings films so many times. And I remember starting with the theatrical release and then the extended editions came out. And oh my, you know, the extended editions. I refuse to watch anything else now. So I have watched the extended editions so many times. I could probably recite them from heart, you know, and I just every time I watch it, there's just that extra layer of detail that I notice. And it, it's, there's just something so special about that. And it, it's just such a wonderful thing. And that will be arguably um, what connects us as autistic people um, and differs, make, you know, means that we differ from um, neurotypical people is that we notice the details. Yeah, we, we really notice the little things. Um, and when it comes when coming back to that idea of predictability and comfort, that also is is um, demonstrated in theories like monotropism that we have that need for predictability as well. So the um, Bayesian theory that um, yes, that our, our autistic brains need to work on predictability. Um, and anything outside of that is, is going to cause us distress. That's why we like the same foods as well as the sensory differences and difficulties. Um, but the predictability of a show that you've watched for the millionth time or a book that you've read for the millionth time is just really comforting that you know what's going to happen. Yeah, it, it's like I said, I can't sleep without that repetition of things. You know, it, 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 it just brings me so much comfort. And I think a note that I have here as well was, because you've already mentioned the de developing a friendship with the characters. So like you say, before you go to bed, it's you're just hanging out with your friends. Um, uh, we also had a note here, which was, it adds the rich inner lives of autistic people. So that was your comment, I think. Do you remember what that was about? Yeah, so... I remember um, what I was talking about when we when we discussed this was uh, at Neuroclastic we did a survey um, and and we asked people about that we asked autistic people about their inner worlds and they were describing them in this survey and, and I published it as an article on Neuroclastic and uh, the one thing I noticed is just how vividly detailed autistic inner worlds are you know it it was it was amazing to read it was it really filled me with a great deal of happiness actually um and i think that all the different forms of media can complement that they add to it they enrich it they they give our imaginations and our inner selves more to work with and that makes me think as well of um so louis uh, partner louis and and um it was Louis, Molly Sherwin, uh, Debbie, I think it was just the three of them. I think that's right. Um, they were talking about the importance of gaming for autistic people. And Molly talked about how, you know, okay, she was talking about gaming or, you know, video games, but it could be anything. It can also help autistic people for the, those of us that struggle with um, our emotions or understanding our emotions or understanding other people's um emotions or perspectives and things like that that we get to do that through those different media um and and like i say because of that rich inner world like where, as soon as you which i hadn't even you know we hadn't talked about talked about it before, prior uh, prior to this which was the red bull series as soon as you did that my mind was just like um, like I say, imagining the mice and and the different characters and um, the pain again after like twenty years of um, a, a character that I liked. I think it was a hare, you know, um, dying in battle. Like oh, the pain. Like twenty years later about this character. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like I say, the importance of those that inner world and connecting um, with those friendships with those characters um because my note here is to remind myself which i don't think it was going to be difficult to talk about the dark tower gunslinger series by stephen king which is i'm really hoping that it you know i can make it eke it out a bit longer but it's such a long string of books because stephen king started writing the gunslinger stroke the dark tower series when he was like 19 in the 70s so there's seven main books 
for the series and then because it's very very sci-fi kind of like kind of gun like uh, western meets sci-fi kind of thing and there's like alternate universes and all this kind of thing a lot of um Stephen King's other books are interwoven so I've been able to read these for such a long time but because I've been reading them for a while and this is what I talked about with you was um because I've been reading them for a while they're the ideas in them are like seeping into my life in a really positive way so within the series they they use this word car ka to mean it's destiny it's it's water you just go with it kind of thing um and actually that's become quite useful and i think i even used it in you know somebody was a little bit um frustrated or upset with something um and i said well it it either it will or it won't be it's car it's destiny just you know and actually it's quite nice that I've absorbed that as opposed to um maybe getting sucked into ruminating about how unjust something is or it's like it'll happen or it won't it's car um, yeah and I think that that leads nicely onto a point I wanted to make was that you know I've learned lessons from from the media that I've consumed and obviously first of all I'm going to you know guess it you know uh, quote Lord of the Rings um well not quote it but um like one of the first lessons I had about what non-toxic masculinity looks like was Aragorn from Lord of the Rings because he's this really masculine warrior you know who's who's becoming you know he's he's on a destined path to become king and he's just so gentle and kind you know he he's especially in the films you know he's a really tender person and it was just I remember being a young boy and thinking you know that's the kind of man I want to be when I grow up and then the other thing I learned was and you know this may go off on some tangents here but my my Lord of the Rings is in a separate category to everything, so bear that in mind when I say this. But my my favourite film, which is also based on a novel by David Mitchell, is Cloud Atlas. And there is a quote which we talked about. And I've got the quote here. And this quote, um, when I walked away from the church, became like a replacement for religion for me. And the quote is titled The Revelation of Somni 451, and it goes, To be is to be perceived, and so to know thyself is only possible through the eyes of the other. The nature of our immortal lives is in the consequences of our words and deeds that go on and are pushing themselves throughout all time. Our lives are not our own. From womb to tomb, we are bound to others, past and present, and by each crime and every kindness, we birth our future. And that quote really just said it all to me. And what it said to me is that simply by existing, I've had an immutable effect on the universe. And I need to leave the universe a better place than what I found it as. And uh, like to learn a lesson that profound from film and, and literature. I think that's a really wonderful thing, you know, and I, I, I wish I could shake the author's hand because that's probably the most profound piece of writing. I, I guess it's like a soliloquy, isn't it? It's the most profound soliloquy I've ever come across. And I've pinned that so people can actually read it as well. So I've pinned it in the comment section um, because yes, when you, told me th about that um so I want to come back to that as well because it made me think so you found that idea of meaning in your life um and the impact that we have on it and things like this from from Cloud Atlas um and it made me think of um how I consider myself very interested in existentialism and you've come at it from just a different way, but it still basically boils down to the same thing that all we have is life, this life for us without wanting to knock anybody else's faiths or anything. But for us personally, all we have is this life and that we wanna do the best that we can and leave a good legacy. Like 
just be good to other people um, and leave the world. We were talking about this earlier on, leave the world, even if it's just the tiniest bit, but the tiniest bit better than how we found it. Um, and like you say, that came from that, you know, revelation um, from Cloud Atlas for you. Yeah, and that, that realisation that every little thing I do ripples out through eternity you know every action every interaction i have with another person it it changes what's going to happen in the future every little thing i do and it made me realize i have this really big responsibility to do good things with with my actions i think that yeah because you that was your example from a book that it really impacted your perception of the world and how you interact with it um, and it's nowhere near as profound, but it just, again, it makes me think of my, it's car, you just, just let it, let it go without singing anything from Frozen, you know, um, based on the Stephen King books that I'm so, so absorbed in and have been for months because the series is so epic. Um, just, yeah, the important impacts these things have on our well-being because it sounds like that, because can you mention, briefly talk about what, what led to that? Like you said that you just, you know, um, walked away from the church and that came at a, a good time yeah so I kind of went in reverse to a lot of other addicts I got sober and unfound God um you know uh, you hear about addicts getting sober and finding God I went the other way um and I think it was because I went through psychosis and I'm not knocking anyone's faith here I, I fall under the atheist spectrum, but I would say I'm probably more agnostic. So it's not strictly that I say there is absolutely no God. I just think it's quite unlikely. Um, but what happened was, I, as I was, you know, I, I, I experienced quite severe psychosis, especially after getting sober. And I realized that for me personally, I was justifying my belief in God and the afterlife the same way that I justified the delusional beliefs I had during my psychosis. And once I had that thought, I couldn't really unthink it. Um, and I just kind of lost faith. And, you know, it, it, I, I guess the seed had already been sown a bit anyway, because I'd seen a lot of hassle go on. You know, my mother is a priest. Um, I saw her suffer horrible misogyny trying to become a priest. You know, she was really not treated very well, uh, especially by, well, by male members of the clergy who were in charge of divining her vocation and, and establishing whether she should become a priest you know it took her 10 years to become a priest when it would take a man to um you know and i i'd become quite disillusioned you know i i didn't understand the church's anti-lgbtq plus laws uh, laws you know can or whatever they call it um i didn't understand why they my mother is a living saint as far as I'm concerned and seeing the way she was treated I was very disillusioned and then once that thing had happened with the psychosis where I realized my belief in God was justified the same way as my belief in my delusions it all just kind of came crashing down and now I, I won't ever say there is absolutely no God because I, I feel that would be just as irrational to say as there definitely is a God because I don't know, simply put, but I just, I don't think it's very likely. So I walked away from the church um, and luckily I found Cloud Atlas because it gave me some direction back in my life. And like you say, so the importance then, just demonstrating the huge significance of different media um, and the amazing people that write these different things that are so important to us as autistic people um because that makes me so going on a bit more of a light-hearted but kind of an annoyed uh, point which is the the importance of these media is when for instance shows get cancelled on cliffhangers it is evil 
to autistic people. Um, and we talked about um, Firefly getting cancelled. I talked about Alphas getting cancelled and actually- Last Man on Earth. Last Man on Earth was cancelled on a cliffhanger. And it, 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 it still winds me up today. It shouldn't be allowed. It should not be allowed. It's so distressing because um, I think I, I said what I, when we were talking about this, I was saying about how um, I didn't know Alphas had been cancelled and it had been cancelled, I think, a few years before I found it on Amazon Prime, I think it was. And so I got into it not knowing it had been cancelled years before. And that really frustrated me because it was actually... Um, it's actually worth watching as long as you're prepared mentally for the fact you will never get um, a conclusion because it, it ends on a cliffhanger. Um, and the reason I like Alpha, so like I said, it's quite a few years ago. Let me just Google when it actually, hold on, Alpha's TV series. Because it talks about neurodiversity when nothing really was in the mainstream. Um, so let me just find out when it was actually cancelled. 2011, 2012, which is around the time I started really reading about and stumbling upon um, neurodiversity. And the show, they talk about neurodiversity. It's all about having these um, extra abilities. And one of the characters, okay, he's white, he's male, and he's autistic. Ignoring that he's white and male because white male autistics do exist. Um, but his abilities are beautiful and amazing. And actually the, the, the actor, I think, had some quite lovely movements that I thought were quite autistic, the movements I would do. And his ability was to um, see electrical signals and things. He could see the internet and manipulate it in the air and things like this. It was amazing. And they ended it on a cliffhanger where basically, you know, I'm going to spoil it for people. You need it spoiled because if you're going to watch it, you need to know and prepare yourself mentally that pre pretty much you think everybody's dead except for the autistic character. And that's it. And they never did anymore. And it's evil. It shouldn't be allowed. I would note for people who were annoyed by Alpha's ending so abruptly, there are two shows set in the same universe as Alpha's, uh, Eureka and Warehouse 13. Now, there is a warning for Eureka. Now, I was watching Eureka long before I had an autism diagnosis, long before I was part of the neurodiversity movement. If you watch Eureka, there is going to be some really frustrating stuff. There is a black autistic character who the mother is quite... Uh, not wanting to use this term, but I'm going to. She's quite a martyr mum. And uh, she's one of the main characters as well, so it's a bit inescapable. Um, and later in the show, they cure his autism through time travel. Oh, no. And that was really disappointing. And, and that, I found it kind of difficult to watch Eureka since realising how problematic that is. Yeah. But there is Warehouse 13, which is also set in the same universe. And that is a fantastic show. Both of these shows had full runs. They ran for five or six seasons each and they both come to satisfying endings. And that's what we want. Okay, we will be distressed that a series comes to an end. I am not looking forward to the day when my Stephen King, uh, I run out of the Dark Tower books. Um, but at least hopefully it will have an ending. It may not be a satisfying ending, I have no idea, but it will be an ending. Whereas, like I say, the ones that just get cancelled is really distressing. And I was really pleased, as much as it's cheesy, it's not like it's um, giving me any of the profound things that we've talked about necessarily, but the show Lucifer. And it's kind of predictable, it's kind of silly, um, and it got cancelled by one, I can't remember who cancelled it, Prime, um, and got picked up by Netflix or vice versa, I can't remember. And the same happened with um, The Expanse. The Expanse is fantastic. If, you, if nobody's seen The Expanse yet, please watch it. Oh, autistic coded character in The Expanse is great. Um, oh, I can't remember his name. Anyway, um, so yeah, that's another show that got cancelled but got picked up by somebody else, which is great for 
us autistic people who need that continuation. Um, but Lucifer has been picked up and uh, at least they know they're going to, like they've got an end point, a definite end point kind of thing. Um, Can we just take a moment to talk about how great it is when films and TV series have like a, a really fleshed out universe? You know, for a really good example is the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know, there are so many films that all come together and tell this overarching story. Another one that I don't hear people talk about much because it's a horror films series is uh, the Conjuring Universe. I love the Conjuring Universe. I've watched all of them loads of times. And uh, if you're into horror movies and you want something with a fleshed out universe, it's not as detailed as Marvel. It's not as detailed as Tolkien's Middle Earth. But if you want a horror film series with a fleshed out universe, watch the Conjuring series. Um, and not just the main Conjuring films, all the little spin-offs as well. And I like, because when we talked about this, you said, which was interesting, because I don't like horror and stuff like that, but my, my <coughs> issue, which I know, I think we did talk about this before, was my issue, frustratingly, there's a couple of things. I get too absorbed if it's emotional or something like that, that I feel it's happening to me. And that can be quite distressing when it's like a horror or a slasher film or something like that. So I can't really watch those because I get too as if it's happening to me. And that's not that's not a pleasant place to be. And then on the flip side, I also have um, a difficulty with, what is it, suspending disbelief. So I, I don't get absorbed because you, you, I remember you talking about this, that you sometimes struggle to read at the moment, but you can get really absorbed in films. And I do like films and shows, but I don't get absorbed in the same way that I will a book. Because with a book, my imagination is huge. With a film or whatever, I'm just going, how did they do that bit? You know, I, I can't come away from knowing that there's actors or where have I seen that actor before? You know, that kind of thing is quite difficult for me to not do. Um, but yeah. I liked you explaining the conjuring because what was it? It's based on real demonologists. It's based on Ed and Lorraine Warren. A lot of their work has been discredited, um, but they were real life uh, uh, demonologists, ghost hunters, whatever you want to call them. And uh, it's based on the, the main Conjuring series, uh, like the Conjuring 1 and 2 and soon to be the Conjuring 3. They're based on cases from their actual files. And uh, it's, it's really interesting to me because whilst I don't really have faith or believe particularly in this stuff anymore, my mother is what they call a deliverance minister. Um, now, a hundred years ago, they'd have called her an exorcist, but I want to make it very clear, she has never performed an exorcism. That's not what really what they do. Uh, most of it is just, you know, guiding people towards mental health support. Um, but she... She goes out to places where people believe they're being haunted. She does house blessings and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I, I have kind of like a morbid fascination with this stuff. You know, uh, it kind of freaks me out sometimes when I'm reading about it, um, even though I don't really believe in it. <laughs> but the films, are really, like I love watching the films with my mum because my mum's going, that's really bad practice. <laughs> that's probably mental health they should have guided them towards some support you know and you know it's it's really fun watching these films with my mum and seeing what someone who does this in real life thinks of the films you know it's uh and, and like i said i just have this kind of morbid fascination with with you know ghost stories and stuff like that and if because i've just remembered i tried to remind myself to tell you this last time we had this conversation and i've just remembered which is good have you actually seen Truth Seekers with uh, Nick Frost? No, oh. I haven't. Okay, I think you'll enjoy it. It's funny and it's kind of silly, but I think you'll enjoy it because it's Nick Frost. Um, and obviously he and Simon, Simon Pegg are really great writers and things. And um, that's about them um, like uh, ghost hunting and things like this. So I think you'll enjoy that. Um, I think the last note I've got I don't know whether it's worth talking about, but it's it's the diff the um the problems with games of throne Game of Thrones. So you you had an issue with Game of Thrones. My issue 
um, with the Game of Thrones series was, so I started reading the books before they made the show. And I got angry at the unpredictable deaths. And I think I was on the third book and I was reading it and another character I was really invested in and liked died. I got really angry, just threw the book across the room. I was like, I'm not doing it anymore. No, he is not doing this to me. I am not getting invested in these great characters and they keep dying in these horrendous ways. Nope, nope, nope. Um, and then when it's the uh, TV series came out, my housemates at the time were watching it. So I went along with it and I watched it with them. I got past the bit in the books that I'd stopped at and another character died in the most horrendous way that I really liked and I was like no I no and I just stopped and I haven't I haven't watched the rest of them you see I managed to get past that but I do see 100% what you're saying because it was almost kind of traumatic the way they kept killing off all the characters I liked I had to learn to stop getting attached to characters although there were still a few that I was like if if they kill off this character I'm going to burn down the production company um but what really annoyed me with Game of Thrones was they 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 did a really I think they did a pretty stellar job, and then in the last season, they just rushed this ending. You know they they did like a, they did less episodes that were longer, so a, a lot more happened. A lot more time passed in a shorter period of time, and it came to this ending that was just way too convenient. It was way too convenient. It was probably not particularly expected, um, which can be a good thing. But in this case, it was like you had no idea what you were doing here and you just made it up as you went along and did it as quickly as you could. Um, and that was really frustrating for me. You know, like we said, you know, we need things to come to a satisfying conclusion if they're going to end. And this just didn't. And I think... I guess the key takeaways for people watching, if you're autistic yourself, or if you're supporting, caring, loving for another autistic person, uh, um, adult or child. So, so I think some of the key takeaway things about how important the different types of media, including the ones that people think are problematic, like video games, how important they are for autistic well-being is the predictability that's why your child watches that show over and over and over again because it's it's comforting it's predictable david's point about they're your friends they are characters you can rely on because you know what's coming you're not going to be let down that the show is going to be cancelled because you already know the ending of a film or a book or whatever I think in terms of protecting our well-being, because I just noted something in the comment section that actually makes me kind of sad for that person. So they were talking, somebody was talking about some shows that they like and mentioned that they were heartbroken or upset or what have you when it got cancelled. Somebody else didn't know that that show had been cancelled. And if you are autistic, I'm so sorry that you've just learned that a show you really enjoyed has been cancelled. So I would say our protective thing that I've definitely learned to do after Alpha's got cancelled and I didn't know is if I like a show after like two or three episodes is to look, how long is this show been running? How long is it going to be running? Has it been going on for a few years and finished and there's a conclusion? Has it been cancelled? If I know it's been cancelled, at least I'm prepared for that as opposed to the shock of losing that show or whatever it is that's... Can I just stand in solidarity with that person as well? Because when they announced they were cancelling Brooklyn Nine-Nine, my best friend Jay actually rang me up and broke the news to me like a good friend had died. And I was gutted, but I was so happy when NBC picked it up and carried it on. You know, we need more, we need more, you know, production companies to do this sort of thing to give shows a chance where other companies won't because so many of us are invested and I just I know what it's like to hear that a show you love is is being cancelled especially when it hasn't come to a satisfying ending um it, it is heartbreaking so yeah all these different medias can do so much for our well-being um but protect yourself 
particularly when it's writers who want to kill off all the characters, looking at you, George R.R. R. Martin, um, you know, it, it's quite distressing then to lose all those characters. But I think ultimately what we've talked about really is that massive connection um, and escapism and predictability about how comforting that is for us as autistic people. Um, so yeah, I think that's all the, all the points that we had, unless you had any others. No, I, I think we've done a pretty good job tonight. We have. I've cut, I've literally been highlighting. We've done that bit. We've done that bit. Good. Lovely. Um, this has probably been my favourite live stream for Academy. <laughs> talking about all the different medias and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, oh, yeah. I love it. So people in the comment section, they've been chatting to each other about um, either shows they like and things like that. So somebody just said they've got like seven tabs open with things that they're going to watch later or look up. Um, which is, yeah, that's another thing as well. If people have got any, um, you know, suggestions for really great things that are worth reading or watching. Um, I love that. I love it when people tell me something. Like the reason I know about the Dark, Se Dark Tower series is because of um, somebody I worked with years ago telling me about it. And I finally, because it was a, such a big series, um, even secondhand, the, you know, the whole series is quite expensive. So I, it took me years before I was like, okay spend the money buy the series um, yeah and if anyone actually has any suggestions for shows similar to brooklyn 99 and new girl that are worth watching find my page and message them to me um yeah so david's um page is linked in the description for this video so um yeah if you've got anything any lists even if you just want to pop them anywhere um on academy or just in the comment section we will have a look at, through them and pick at people's brains oh and lastly amy's saying love the dark tower um but the film is so shockingly poor yeah i don't even bother with the with the, the, the film i don't know how they thought they could squeeze that epic series that he was writing since he was 19 into films i don't know um oh somebody just said angel like buffy spin-off and things like that um yeah lovely so nice hopefully uh, positive life for people and the importance of any form of media for autistic well-being. Um, thanks so much, David, and thanks everybody in the comments section, you lovely, lovely people. And now just thinking what we got next week that I can tell you about. What have we got next week? Next week we have Dr. Katrina Stewart uh, talking about autistic employment issues and peer support. So that's going to be um, a nice one as well. Something very different though. Um, yeah, lovely. Thanks everybody.